so let's just do a quick review. This is the last thing we talked about on Wednesday. Um, we talked about the pres preservation ethic, the conservation ethic, and the land ethic. And then now we're going to talk about the people that actually were responsible for each one. So first is the preservation ethic. This was um, kind of came about through the ideas of John Muir. Um, John Muir is shown with President Roosevelt. He was um, a Republican president that was responsible for um, a lot of environmental pr protection at the time. So he advocates for unspoiled nature and preserving nature for its own sake and for human fulfillment. Um, John Muir basically said that natural areas were required by humans basically to go and restore themselves in wild nature. The conservation ethic is a little bit different. Um, this is Gifford Pinchot, and he was actually the United States first forester. And he advocated for using natural resources wisely for the greatest number of people, basically, and the greatest good. So this is very anthropocentric idea, but um, it's basically the idea we don't want to use up our resources completely because we as humans like to use them. The last one is a little bit more confusing for a lot of students. Um, this is called the land ethic, although this is one that um, I personally like quite a bit. Um, and basically the ethical principle is easy to summarize from his own words. He says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, beauty, and stability of the biotic community. And it's wrong if it tends to do otherwise. So the question is in this image down here, does this show something good or not based on the land ethic. Now, of course, if we don't necessarily know anything about the natural world, we might say, hey, setting a fire, fires are destructive. Destructive equals bad. Um, but if you know a little bit more about ecology, you'll actually find out um, that a tall grass prairie like this actually requires a certain amount of fire to actually maintain its integrity as a prairie. It also ultimately will make it more beautiful, beautiful um, and gives that particular community stability because without fire, um, that prairie will become something else, usually a woodland. So a couple of other quotes. This is one of my favorites. One of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to the layman. The layman meaning somebody that, you know, doesn't, you know, an average person that doesn't necessarily know a lot of the plants and animals. And you know, if you don't know anything about plants, you just kind of look at this and you say, oh, there's some trees and there's some green plants and there's some flowers in there and it looks fine. But I can look at this particular environment because I have a background as a botanist and recognize this is a restored prairie because there's a restricted number of plants in this particular area. It's better than a mowed lot, which has very little, um, but this actually has a few plant species compared to, for example, this. This is actually a wild prairie. This is paintbrush prairie just south of Sedalia. And these right here, these are echinacea or coneflower. This is echinacea pallida. Um, it's not one you usually find in the stores. And this one down here is goat's root to frosia. There's a couple of other species coming up. There's some other um, composites coming right there. So there's actually more diversity of plants in an environment like this versus the restored um, prairie that we saw in the previous image. So how can you start to become ecologically aware? One of the way, main things that I like is um, there's an app called iNaturalist. It's for, um, uh, for Android and um, Apple systems. And you can use this and you can actually identify pretty much any kind of living thing. And it works all around the world. If you look at this um, screenshot I have, it's actually got a, an insect from Asia, from India. So you can use that to figure out what it is you're at is actually in the world around you. It's funny when you learn about those things, you start to value them a little bit more. So I highly recommend that. And when we talk about the extra credit in another week or so, um, this will be one of the things you can do for extra credit is basically using this app to identify some things. Okay, so next topic is environmental justice. So I have actually linked a video for you guys that kind of gives you a little bit of background. It's a little bit old. I mean, these things change on a dime because political changes occur pretty rapidly. Um, but historically, there's, and even recently, there's been a lot of issues as far as 
basically pollution and polluted environments and basically they're oftentimes placed in areas that have less political power and usually these are places that are relatively poor and or have a higher proportion of minority uh, people living there and so they un unfortunately have to suffer from a lot of pollution versus other populations don't have to suffer as much. Um, but that doesn't mean that they've necessarily taken that line down and there's been a lot of protests about this and recognition that this is a real problem that needs to be dealt with. Uh, there's a really good example, and granted this dates back to um, World War II, which is a really long time ago, but there were a lot of uranium mines in um, a Native American area, the Navajo Nation, and basically they were didn't really have a choice and there were a lot of uranium mines there and unfortunately people were exposed to radiation and uranium in, in addition to being radioactive it's also very toxic so they're still working on cleanup of this stuff even though it's from a really long time ago all right so sustainability is the idea of using resources in such a way that Basically, it does not use up the capability of the planet to regenerate those resources. And basically, sustainability is kind of one of these big buzzwords, but really it kind of has its roots in the idea of the conservation ethic. Is we're basically, we're using things, but we're not, the idea is that we're not going to use them up. Um, so there's lots of these we can actually think about. We're mostly focused on the environmental aspect uh, management of air, water, land, and of course waste. And that's actually the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, tragedy of the commons. So this is the idea that basically when you have a common area and you have people that aren't really regulated by either government or by any kind of super ethical framework or anything like that, um, tends to be people will use up that resource collectively and then basically it will just crash. Um, classic example of that is the Grand Banks cod fishery. So it was stable for a very long time. Um, unfortunately, people developed um, very large ships, um, basically floating processing plants, and they would catch the fish um, in very large quantities, freeze them, and then they were able to ship them back to the mainland. And because of that, they basically just ran through pretty much all of the cod fishery. In any case, you should watch the video that actually explain this, explains this, talking about um, fishing in a small pond. Uh, the last concept, which you'll be asked to look at on a quiz, is the ecological footprint. And the ecological footprint is basically the idea of how much physical land area is necessary to restore the amount of the resources that we use and also to accept the waste that we produce.